The Remedial Herstory Project is a nonprofit working to get women's history into the primary and secondary history curriculum. To help us meet our goal, we produce media, lesson plans, and so much more. You can check it out on our website, www.remedialherstory.com. Our project is funded through grants and by patrons, potentially like you. Thank you to our patrons, Jeff, Barbara, Christian, Kent, Jamie, Jenna, Nancy, Megan, Leah, Mark, Nicole, Anne, Sarah, Alicia, Katia, Michelle, Jessica, Laura, and Jackie. If you would like to join these wonderful people and become a patron, you can head over to patreon.com and become a supporter of the Remedial Herstory Project. You too can help us reform education and allow women to be seen, heard, and complicated. Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell everyone what's happening in today's episode? In today's episode, we are going to the Protestant Reformation in Europe. Great. And we're going to learn about women in the Reformation. Let's do this. (laughs) Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%, the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. In this episode, we are asking the question, were Protestant women just wives and mothers? Yes. And we no, are- no. <laughs> <laughs> Immediate answer, I need more information. <laughs> We are joined on this episode by one of the Remedial History board members, Caroline Taylor. Yeah. And um, she is from the great United Kingdom. So you're going to hear an excellent accent coming up. We've had many excellent accents, but hers is so lovely. So lovely. Okay. So what are we talking about? So the Protestant Reformation is, uh, think Martin Luther. Does that sound familiar at all? Yes. So this is like Henry VIII time period? It is. Good hey. job. Dang, girl. So Snaps. But this is in Europe. Martin Luther lives in Germany. He Germany. is um, – he works within the church, and he's becoming very frustrated with church practices. They are charging people. The Catholic Church is charging people for what? their salvation. Thieves. He <laughs> uh there's a lot of corruption in the church. Church leaders are getting really wealthy. And yeah, they were some of the wealthiest people at that time yeah. was those in charge of the church. Yeah. The pulpit. They were supposed to like, you know, abstain from sexual activity and there were like orgies going on what? and just like mind blown stuff that they, he did not think was right. You mean when you tell people to not do something, they do it more? <laughs> I'll say. So he writes his 95 theses that are he, you know, slams down. He he nails to the door of right. the of the church and um, basically begins the Protestant Reformation, which he's leads like, we're out of here. Wars um, throughout Europe, um, conflicts between Protestants, so the protesters against the church, Protestants, mm-hmm. and the Catholics who are trying to uphold traditional you Rome. Know, ch- Rome, church values. Sometimes lost is that the Catholic Church also undergoes their own reformation because they're realizing, like, they're yeah, we do have, people. yeah, we do have these issues, and we should probably do something about it. I guess we'll listen to Martin. Um, but King Henry the Eighth li- does live during this time, um, and and he the- switches from the Church of England, right? Why you know his deal is is so different, and we're okay. gonna we're gonna almost stay away from England for the for this episode just because it's like <laughs> Germany. It's we're a on totally Germany. different thing. Yeah, we're gonna look at Germany and Switzerland, um, bits of France, um, okay. so sort of mainland Europe, and the way that this is um, manifesting in the lives of real women who lived in that time. Um, we can just quickly touch on King Henry VIII. I mean, he wants to divorce his wife, and right, he so uses he, yeah. this uh, this this whole religious conflict as a way to separate from Rome because they won't give him a divorce. divorce yeah, and um, and that might just help center our audience in like when we are, but. In the Reformation, you know, so the Renaissance precedes the Reformation. And one thing that I think is lost in um, 
lots of dialogues in history classes is how just because something was a breakthrough for men in power Mm -hmm. does not mean it was a breakthrough for everybody else. And the Renaissance is a really good example of people being like, it brought back culture and yeah, it was and art, education, music, and yeah. art, and science, and all these things. And it's like, yes, but it was, it it did not. It was not inclusive of women, and it did not lead to sweeping reforms for women's education, women so being art, and all those things. And oddly, what did lead to that is the Protestant Reformation, because Martin Luther, in order to combat corruption adopted this sort of ideology that people should be able to read the Bible themselves, interpret the Bible themselves. And that's what he wanted women to read. He wanted people to be able to read. Okay. But he also knew that women are the primary educators in the home. Right. And so if you want mass education, you need to educate women so that they can be teachers. Right. And so sort of, he, I would not say that Martin Luther was a champion of women. There are lots of quotes. That wasn't that, one of his articles? <laughs> no. One of his quotes was, let them birth children till they die of it. Like, he just, he's not pleasant. It's uh, a little gross. But oddly, he results in the a- opportunity o- opportunity for women to improve their condition and their station and um, to be educated and be informed and be a part of later things like the Enlightenment and, and okay. all these all right, all right. other dialogues. Eventually ask for their rights because they can read, you know, th- documents and being like, oh, so universal rights, freedom, liberty. Hmm. hmm. You know. I think he's on to something here. <laughs> so, so oddly – he becomes, it is this big breakthrough. But one of the things in terms of the actual reformation that sometimes is lost and the in the work of reforming, mm-hmm. right? The work of challenging the church. St- and part of it is like standing your own in opposition to the church. Of the most powerful entity at that time too. Mm-hmm. It's not like it's like one kingdom it's all it's the empire okay well i mean the empire is fractured but it is the prevailing belief right. system right so yeah and and women are not only part of it um as followers they're not only benefiting from it but they're active participants in essentially the radical movement of Mm -hmm. the time period and they are doing so much and caroline is going to tell us more about it yay okay so uh, let's have her introduce herself to our audience take it away hey so i'm caroline um i'm from south wales and i work for a church here as their youth and families worker um, but I studied history at university, um, kind of in my undergrad, I st- looked at lots of different things and then over time kind of started focusing more on um, female spirituality in the Christian church, especially in the Middle Ages um, and then the Reformation as well. Um, and now I do lots of different research about women in the Christian church history um, for my blog and for some of the stuff I do for church as well. That's amazing. So it's interesting growing up as a, a Christian Obviously, I could see that lending itself to research in your church and in and, and your degree. But how did you get to women in the Reformation? Because I don't think a lot of people, when they think about the Reformation, think about women. They think about like Martin Luther. So how did you how did you get there? Yes, yeah, so I, I grew up with Christian history books for kids, um, which focused on like specific people that you could learn from. And um, in my the summer of my second year at uni, I was given a book by Claire Heath White, which is called The First Wives Club, which looks at the wives of some of the reformers that I kind of knew already. So like Martin Luther's wife and Calvin's wife. And um, it was it was meant to be like devotional, like you learned from these women and like thought about your own life. Um, but I just got really interested in the history side of it and started reading around it more um, in my spare time. And so when they were like, what do you want to do your dissertation on? When I came back at the beginning of third year, I was like, well, this is what I want to do my dissertation on. And um, that's what I pursued. Mm. 
And you have kind of a funny story that you've written about on your blog related to that, right? So you have this idea of what you want to study and you tried to pitch it. What happened? <laughs> yeah, so the, the way that you um, go about doing your dissertation at the university I studied at, um, you write a proposal and you have to have like these lists of the sources you're going to use and the secondary sources you're going to use. And it took me ages to put mine together. And then I sent it away. And then they, they pair you up with a professor who's going to supervise you. And um, when I arrived, um, my professor, who is this well-known, um, really respected guy in the department, um, a tenured professor, and he um, hadn't read my proposal beyond like the first few lines. It became apparent very quickly. And he was just like, this could be a chapter at most, but probably only a paragraph because women didn't do anything in the Reformation except be wives and mothers. And so <laughs> I was just like, well, that's just not true. Um, but he was, yeah, really insistent on it. And um, I left that um, meeting in tears and rang up um, the professor in charge of dissertations. and was like, please, can I have a different supervisor? Um, and so I was given another supervisor, which was great. And um, this supervisor helped me do my dissertation, which ended up being an argument that um, women were not just wives and mothers during the Reformation. Um, in response to that one conversation. And now my blog is called Not Just Wives and Mothers to highlight that women have never been just wives and mothers in the history of the church um, because that phrase doesn't even work out. No one is just a wife and mother. It, it stuck that. with me. <laughs> so amazing. I love that some jerk has essentially been the foundation for you to have this amazing online presence and a lot of followers through social media. Um, and I love learning about these women from you through, through what you post online. It's, it's really fascinating. So thank you for sharing and changing the narrative. So based on the research you've done, how would you characterize women in the Reformation? I think women in the Reformation did do a lot, but I think they were they were confined because of their gender quite heavily. And I think that's meant that as historians have studied the Reformation, they've kind of looked at what the men did and compared the women to the men and found the women wanting um, because they haven't really taken into consideration the wider things that were in play in the women's life and how that directed what involvement they were able to have in the Reformation. Um, because we do see them being involved in lots of different ways in lots of different spheres. Um, and sometimes it's classed as active involvement. And sometimes it's just seen as like what they should have done as a wife or a mother to a to a ref male reformer. Yeah, absolutely. So that and that's so interesting because I think a lot of times when I'm looking for women to talk about in different eras, I stumble upon that same problem where it's like, how you know, we had a debate at this um, AP Institute I went to where we were trying to cut down the number of sources we were asking students to use in a class. And we had these five or six different people from uh, an era. And the debate essentially came down to, do you cut the black man, the white man, or the woman? <laughs> and it was like, no, you can't cut any of it because those are such different perspectives. And of course, the white man had just a much more prolific presence than the other two did. And so, but but the fact that the white woman was saying anything and the black man was saying anything is so profound and important so anyway, it was just it's kind of interesting that that's that's a barrier. Yeah, and it's it was a barrier that was going on like during the time as well and then something that's carried through into how history's remembered and recorded them. Yeah, which is it's sad to see because you've got things like um Calvin was very close with a lot of different women um and they gave him like financial support and they gave his followers um, safe refuge in their homes if they were able to, like especially wealthy women who owned land. Um, and so I class them as reformers because they were actively doing things in, to, to aid the Reformation. Um, but th that's not how they were viewed and that's not necessarily how they viewed themselves. And then you've got Calvin, whilst taking advantage of their generosity like this, later on when wars come and they have like their children taken away from them and they have they are not allowed outside of their homes and things like this. Um, 
he writes that oh you can't trust these noble women and it's like well you're not you're not taken into into account that as a woman she's in a much more vulnerable position in that society like they were under their their finances were controlled by men their social lives were controlled by men and so they couldn't do what men could to for the reformation um and then the stuff that they were able to do was kind of not seen as as important um and that's not correct <laughs> so wealthy women shelter uh people during the reformation what things do what other things are women in this time doing well this is the thing because it's been recorded in favor of men like the what the records we have are all about men really um we don't know what normal women were doing we know that they were in the reformation and we know that they um if they did convert that they were zealous in that that they stuck to it and were faithful to that um to the faith of the reformers um and we know that women were leading bible study groups across europe um in aid of the reformation um but the records we have are primarily about either wealthy women who we know about because they were wealthy and so they were recorded because their their lives were already in the public view a bit more um and then we have the women who wrote things and that we somehow been able to keep um copies of what they wrote which is incredible um and then we've got the women who were married to reformers um because they were unique because before that um priests weren't allowed to marry so these were the first women to be marrying publicly preachers and so they were unique and made kind of not celebrities but um were well known because of the uniqueness of their position um and so those are the women that i've kind of concentrated on in my research so some women start as really just the wives of reformers right and so i know they're not just wives but could you tell me um about the role that these women played in the reformation or maybe about a couple of them Yes, yeah, so the wives are really interesting because um, they they show the tension that existed even in the reformers about how much they wanted women to be involved. Um, because there's a sense at the beginning of the Reformation that they kind of need they need as much help as they can get. It's an all hands on deck kind of situation, and so women are really involved, and that includes their wives. Then, as the reform kind of starts to settle down a bit, as they kind of won land and they've built churches and things like this. Um, You've, like from about yeah 1523 to 24 they oh, they start to like try to distance themselves from women and um so when you've got their wives who had been really involved you kind of see that tension playing out um so one of them who i really recommend people read about is Catherine Zell um so Catherine Zell was married to Matthias Zell and when she marries she's the first clerical wife in Strasbourg which was one of the hubs for the reformation um, and instantly she gets a lot of abuse because of her marriage. She's called a concubine and a lot worse. Um, and she writes this um, letter basically justifying her marriage. Um, and it's interesting that it's her that does that and not her husband, that she's the one that feels she needs to defend her marriage. And I think it's the archbishop of the town replies and he doesn't reply and argue with her about theology he just says that she's a concubine that her husband hasn't paid tax for yet and that's it he had no other response but Katharina was in Strasbourg she was part of the Strasburgers a group of reformers there and she helped them she organized conversations with them when they started to disagree on things she sheltered some of them when they were having to run away and um, during some of the wars um, and she financially supported them where she could as well. And Catherine was incredible. She kind of started setting up um, a refugee kind of situation in Strasbourg because they had all these refugees coming there. Um, and so she set up basically a welfare state in Strasbourg to support them. And um, and then on top of this, she also felt like um, she describes herself as a church mother and calls um, that she has her own office to fulfill as a clerical wife. Um, which is completely groundbreaking and new. Um, and so she does things like she writes children's books and um, songs for parents to sing in order to help them teach their children doctrine. Um, and she does all of this and she's really involved. And then her husband dies. And the person who takes over for her husband in the church really doesn't like her. He doesn't like the fact that she's so involved in the Reformation. He finds it threatening to his own ministry. He doesn't like that she befriends people of um, different beliefs um so she 
goes and there's there's someone who lives on the outskirts of the city who doesn't believe what the reformers believes but isn't a catholic and um she goes to visit him and because he's dying and she gives him a funeral basically um and when she comes back um the successor of her husband calls her a heretic and starts to have the civil authorities investigate her um to try and clamp down on her and she she looks back at her life and says that she was so involved in the reformation and she she sees it as a, a betrayal that now they're turning against her um and she dies shortly before she was probably going to end up getting arrested so it's interesting that in this in this one woman this one wife we see that they were really involved in the reformation they were allowed to do certain things um but then very quickly they feared the respectability of the Reformation was going to be threatened if they kept letting women get involved. And so they they pushed them back. So Katharina goes from being a, a helper of the Reformation who, you know, was a friend of Luther and Luther commended her. He gave her the nickname Doctress Katharina um, all the way to being pushed out. What a sad story. I mean, what an amazing story and also sad story because she sounds like a total badass. And I love that she. You know, it's funny, your preface about they're not just wives and mothers, and yet she refers to herself as a church mother, right? And and, um, she is a clerical wife, but as a wife, she like sets up an office, right? And like is doing all this amazing charitable work for the area. So what a fascinating human. I'm so excited to learn more about her. Um, So do any women in the Reformation period, write, I mean, she, so she writes children's books. Do other people write more theological or philosophical pieces? Yeah, definitely. Um, the one who I think writes the most theologically and especially theology surrounding women is, um, a woman called, um, Marie Gentia, who's in, who was in Geneva for most of her life. Um, so she was raised um, in a convent and so she was raised in the convent and had a convent education, so education. So she um, could uh, read and write Latin. Um, she could, she knew the Bible inside out. Um, and then she converts to the faith of the reformers and becomes a Calvinist and ends up marrying a minister and then moving to Geneva to help with the reformation effort there. Um, and when she arrives, she's, she's really keen to get involved and she has all this education behind her and she especially wants to reach out to women who are in convents um, because that that makes sense um but she gets there and she just doesn't agree with the reformers and the reformers don't agree with her and so they start to push her to one side and they don't really let her get involved and the main point of disagreement is that she believed that women should be allowed to teach the bible Um, even if they were only allowed to teach the Bible to other women in the form of like Bible studies and things like that, which the reformers didn't agree with in Geneva. Um, So they push her out. And um, her response is to write a series of books, some of which have survived and some of which haven't. Um, But one of them is, um, she wrote in 1539, and it's called The Defense of Women. And she writes it to um, Margaret of Nevers, um, who was a queen of Nevers in France, who was well, we don't know if she was a reformer, but she she definitely had disagreements with the Catholic faith. Um, and so she writes this book about how women have been um, treated unfairly throughout the history of the church because of their interpretation of the Bible um, and basically argues that women should be allowed to teach the Bible. And there's nothing theologically stopping them from being able to teach the Bible to other women. And so they should be allowed to. And it's a shame that these men are kind of holding them back um, because of um, basically sexist theology. And one of my favorite parts is she she looks and she she looks at all the heretics and she goes, haven't all the recent heresies been inspired by men, not women? Um, and it's just great. She she doesn't really hold any punches and she signs it MD, just her initials. Um, and the thing is that um, pretty soon people um, work out that it's her, that she wrote this. Um, and so when it comes out that it's written by a woman, it has a completely different response and in Geneva, all copies of it are burnt, and that happens across in different Reformation cities. So this isn't Catholics persecuting her or trying to shut down her voice. This is her fellow reformers are trying to um, shut down her voice. And um, 
it's clearly because she's a woman, not because of what she writes. Um, one of the reformers somewhere else in Europe, um, Comte is asked to read her book and because the, the council there want to know if they should be promoting it or if they should be burning it. And he replies after he's read it saying that there's nothing theologically unsound in her book, but because it's written by a woman, it would be better to suppress it. Um, so her book ends up being being burnt again. And so it's it's really surprising that it even survives and it's taken a long time for its authorship to be um, found again. Yeah, so she she wrote theologically, but then was suppressed. Oh my gosh, that's so, it you know, I, it kind of reminds me of like Alain de Gouche or somebody from the French Revolution, um, similarly being like, hey, we're in this like moment that is so unbelievable and we're making all this incredible progress for humanity, for the church, for everything. Like, can we just include women in everything that you're saying? And it's like, and no, you know, and Alain de Gouche is, you know, a woman in the French Revolution who very similarly um, just, you know, writes and says like, yeah, all these things that you're talking about with democracy, but also women and they execute mm. her. So it's like, you know, as, as a traitor to the revolution. So, I, wow, that's fascinating. She seems incredible. Yeah, she, she is. And I think, um, yeah, she's, uh, if you go to Geneva now, there's the wall of reformers is one of their like um, tourist spots. And she's the only woman that's on the wall and she's not on the wall properly, but she's got like a little brick in front of the wall, but she's still the only woman on that wall. So um, it's gone completely full circle for her. Um, but yeah, I think again, she's another case of because no one takes into account how different it was for women that her experience isn't viewed as it should be maybe like she didn't die. She wasn't killed um, for what she said or how she was treated. But she was completely ostracized from the reformers in Geneva, which is, you know, where she'd where she'd been massively involved. She'd even written to defend Calvin when he got kicked out of Geneva. Um, and then he comes back and completely rejects her help and everything and then slanders her and her husband. And it gets to the point where when Marie dies, um, when she passes away, her husband remarries the same year. And it's possible that her husband remarried while she was still alive so then their marriage broke down because of this um slander that was against them by these reformers um so her her life is really not made nice at all by the reformers like she kind of loses everything because of what she says because of the way they treat her not because they disagreed with her theologically but because they disagreed with her because she was a woman promoting a better place for women in the church uh, I just my I wish people could see my my jaw like I'm just like what <laughs> Hey Kelsey, I don't think our listeners know about the new upcoming project that we're working on. Which one? The video series. Oh, the video series. That's awesome. <laughs> I know. So I thought we could tell them a little bit about what the project is, how it's funded, and what the purpose is. Well, we are producing a video series, 25 episodes on U.S. history, 25 episodes on world history. And the point of these is to provide teachers who don't know women's history with like a 10 minute video that they could play for their class. So say you're teaching a lesson on the American Revolution. Here's 10 minutes about women in that time period. Amazing. And it could be a foundation that you can springboard from and do something really cool on those women. And these videos are, yes, you, but they are yeah. fully scripted. You can look at the scripts. They're nicely edited with some really great content. Yep. They're vetted by historians, two PhDs, at least in history. So, you know, people smarter than me. <laughs> <laughs> but they're going to be free and they're on YouTube. And they'll be on YouTube. They also have a comedian from Hollywood yes. who is helping to make them funny. So it's, you know, because I'm like kind of boring. Uh, no, it's very <laughs> funny. <laughs> but that's awesome. So they're really engaging and they're really cool content. So more to come there. So we yeah. have those coming out. And those are funded through grants? Through grants, through our patrons. Okay. Um, so their, you know, contributions to us through Patreon 
are supporting that project. And then we also have a lot of people that have been donating through Instagram, Facebook. We have a Venmo account. You can find us there. That's awesome. Um, and they're making those contributions. So yeah, it's an amazing thing. And if this is something that you're like, yes, that's what teachers need. Any, every penny helps because it is a really expensive project. So. It, yeah, totally. And we had a match donor for a while there too, yeah. which is really cool. So definitely if you're people interested in those, yeah, feel free to donate. You can donate right on our website, Instagram and Venmo. Yeah. Which is awesome. Great work. I'm excited mm -hmm. to see the rest of those videos. Oh, Brooke, thanks for your support of the project. Awesome. Um, you made a, a, a comment about how not a lot is written about, about women in the Reformation. And I know that this is, you know, obviously an issue you dealt with in trying to write your, your thesis for college what, you know, it strikes me and it's interesting, like, okay, here are the reformers. We're going to build this wall and this monument to it in Geneva. And then she gets like a side brick, you know, like why, um, what is, is, is that partly because the narrative that the reformers wrote is still just repeated or why do you, why do you think that is? And what have you seen in your, in your reading? I think it's because, um, like the Reformation is, is very important across Europe, primarily because it is still affects the religions that are practiced in the countries in Europe. Um, and so I think because it's it's not a, a movement, it's a it's a religious change, um, a lot of concentration falls on the on the reformers because they're the ones who wrote the theology for it. Um, and so because that theology remains important today. Um, it's like it's separated from the history. So they're they're remembered primarily as theologians, not as reformers. And because these women didn't write the, any of the theology books that are part of the Reformation, they don't get remembered in the same way. And the kind of historical um, part of the Reformation almost doesn't get remembered in the same way. Like I think people are very, especially people within the church, are very quick to forget that you know, this was a period of change that was accompanied by by actual wars and fighting and families being torn apart. Um, it wasn't just about a change in what people believed. Um, it was it was a huge change on the political, social, economic scale of the whole whole continent of Europe. Um, and because women fall very much into the historical side of things, I think that's partly why they haven't been remembered um, to the same extent as as the men have. The, the Oxford Very Short Introduction was um, promoted in 2017 because it was um, everyone was celebrating the 500th year anniversary of the Reformation. Um, Peter Marshall, who wrote that book, he, he writes that scholarship about the Reformation tends to focus on what happened, how the Reformation affected women rather than how women affected the Reformation. Um, and after saying that, he then goes goes off he he doesn't revisit women at all then he doesn't mention a single woman he just talks about them in, as a homogenous group and doesn't talk about a how the reformation affected them or b how they affected the reformation um, he just points out this hole in scholarship and then leaves it be that is just mind-boggling to me and i guess it it speaks to part of the problem with historiography about when if women's voices are being suppressed in their time and so there isn't a lot of things to draw from in the history because their books are being burned or whatever. It, it makes it hard. And then, yeah, the, like, wow, it's just so, so wild that contemporary historians aren't able to write that wrong and at least talk about it the way that you're talking about it. Right. Like they were doing this and, you know, it, it's one of those tricky things in history where, it's both empowering and oppressing at the same time, you know, like, cause these women are so inspiring, um, despite probably living rough lives. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the stories that highlights that the most is, um, a woman called, uh, Rula von Grumbach, who is in Bavaria. Um, so we only really found out about her 30, 40 years ago. Um, so she, is now known as the only ref reformer in Bavaria during the time. Um, and she's on board with the Reformation almost immediately. She um, reads all of Luther's books and converts to his faith, um, the idea of justification through faith alone. Um, 
And she doesn't really intend to get involved in the Reformation, but she ends up doing so accidentally. Um, well, accidentally on purpose. And um, so this, this student in the university where her husband works is, is arrested for being a reformer. And she writes in defense of him and ends up writing and producing these pamphlets. And um, she's writing between 1523 and 1524. That's the only, like one year is the amount of time she was writing. But during that time, it was an estimated uh, 29,000 copies of her pamphlets were distributed, um, which is a huge number, but we don't really have any copies of them anymore. Um, because they were suppressed. And at the same time, she was writing to all of the leaders of her um, area, trying to gain their support for the Reformation, or at least for the fair treatment of reformers. Um, And part of her correspondence includes letters writing to Luther. Um, And the response is really to to crack down on her by telling her husband to to lock her up, to chop off her fingers if he needs to, um, and to kill her if, if he needs to as well. Um, and she's aware of this. She writes in a letter to one of her relatives saying that she knows that this is going on and she's upset with them for not trying to defend her. Um, but it appears that it works because after that, she does kind of drop off um, the, the radar for a little while. Um, her husband dies and she's left with children and she has to um, financially find money somewhere. Um, she ends up remarrying and kind of goes into the country to raise her children and make sure that they're going to be OK. Um, and. Then she's reported of dying when she's in her, I think, late 50s. Um, and that's traditionally where her story ended. But then it turns out she she actually didn't die. Her family just spread that as a bit of a rumour because they weren't too happy that she was a reformer. Um, because there's a report of a 70-year-old woman being arrested um, who has the same last name as a ruler. Um, and she's being held um, in the prison because she was handing out Lutheran pamphlets. And they write in the records that um, basically that she's been a real fawn in their side for decades and that she should die soon. So they're not really going to bother doing anything with her. But it's crazy because this is a woman who was, you know, active in the Reformation until her 70s, um, just in different ways. And it's crazy that we didn't know who she was or what she did really until a few decades ago. Um, And now she's appearing in books. Lots of research has been done into her. Because her family suppressed her activities, because they spread rumours about her death, because they clamped down on her reading and tried to get rid of her her pamphlets, um, she could be one of the many names we have of women who definitely did something, but we don't know what they did. Um, And that was so almost her story and how history remembered her. And thankfully, it's not because she's incredible. If it almost happened to a ruler, it's definitely happened to thousands of other women throughout history and definitely in the Reformation too. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Into her seventies. <laughs> Into her seventies, like handing out pamphlets and being arrested because, because Bavaria never, never reforms. It never goes over to the reformers, even though lots of the surrounding countryside did. And um, yeah, she is the only recorded reformer um, working in, in Bavaria during that time. You mentioned before that this conflict, you know, this this reformation creates a lot of like actual physical conflict and wars. And probably the most the biggest one is in France, right, with the Huguenots, who are the the Protestants uh, working to to reform the society there. What role are women playing in either France or other conflicts as It turns from just sort of like the exchanging of ideas and the passing out of pamphlets to like war. Yeah, I think the the French War of Religion is is a really um, good example of how women played an active role during the actual wars that accompanied the Reformation. Um, And I've mentioned uh, Marguerite, the Queen of Navarre, um, because um, that family were really involved in the wars of religion. So Marguerite, her faith is kind of a bit more clouded. We don't really know what she believed and if she would have called herself a reformer. Um, but her daughter is is not the same. She openly declares herself a Calvinist. And it's her family um, that are kind of the centre of the wars of religion. Um, and so she is massively involved and so are her children as well. Um, her son becomes a Catholic and so is then on the Catholic side, but her daughter is on the Protestant side um, and marries a Protestant. And um, 
we see both of them um, and some of her other female relatives being involved in this. So Jeanne de Albert, um, Marguerite's daughter, um, she forms battle plans. She's on the battlefield. Um, she's um, selling her jewellery to raise funds. She's writing to important women across Europe and important men to um, secure their support and funding. Um, and she's a strategist and, you know, rallies the troops whilst offering her land as a place of refuge as well. Um, and then you have women like Eleanor de Roy, who she was another relative of Jeanne, but I can't think off the top of my head how she's related. But there's reports of her and her husband being involved in the wars. And there's a point where she goes to, um, I think it might be Orléans, to support the siege that's going on there. Um, and she's she's literally, um, I think, weeks after giving birth to twins, she is on horseback going to this place. And she works in the hospital there. She works to build up the the, um, the walls that are there. And she's not the only woman that's there. There are other women there and other noble women there who are doing the same work. Um, one of her friends, who's a, a, a noble French woman, um, dies while she's there because plague enters the city while they're there. And um, she unfortunately dies and she watches some of her friends and relatives die while she's there. And then her husband is captured and she, again, like like Xi'an, goes on a letter writing campaign to gain support for him. Um, so their involvement is more behind the scenes, but it's it's not behind the scenes. They're sitting patiently in a palace. It's behind the scenes as in they're on the battleground, <laughs> um, supporting in whatever way they can, whilst also being mothers um, and wives. That's unbelievable. I'm sorry. I'm like still on. She gave birth to twins and then was on horseback. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's, it's one of the things I like to stress whenever I talk about her because it's like it's not some of the things just say like, oh, she, you know, came to came to Orleans here. And I, I worked out and I was like, that was not that long after her children were born. And I think we need to stress that as an important thing. Um, that's not. That's not something women would choose to do. Um, that is something she she felt that she needed to do for the Reformation and for the sake of her family that were fighting. And um, that's not something she would have preferred to do under any other circumstance. So I guess my last question to you is, is there anything that I didn't ask you about that you want to make sure we include to our audience? I think it would it would be to take into account the way their gender affected um the kind of persecution they, they faced. Um, because I think when we talk about any kind of religious persecution, it, it tends to focus on on violence and death and war. And that was the experience of lots of people during the Reformation. Um, but for women, their, their gender played a huge role in it and affected the way that they were persecuted. Um, so you just have to imagine that these were women living in a society where the men around them dictated what they were able to do and controlled them um, to a very large extent. And lots of women converted during the Reformation um, against the wishes of their family. And I think the the French nobility, the the um, de Albert family, the family of the Queen of Nevers, are great examples of that. We have records of um, Marguerite being being beaten by her husband when she's found praying. We have Jeanne talking about how she feared for her life um, because she was, again, in a society where the men around her didn't agree with her and they could easily have, have taken her down. Um, Marguerite has her allowance reduced so that she wouldn't be able to support um, the reformers anymore. Um, but I think the, the saddest example of the absolute control um, these men had and how they used it um, to try and stop the, the women and their families from becoming reformers is the case of Charlotte um, de Bourbon, who was um, Jeanne Albert's daughter. Um, and she's forced by her brother, who converts to Catholicism, to marry a Catholic when she didn't want to. Um, and she, she does end up doing it to appease him, but she, she never wanted to marry a Catholic. And then when she does become part of the Bourbon family, who were all Catholic, she still tries to support the reformers. And um, her father-in-law and her brother conspire against her to have all of the reformers taken out of her court. Um, so they control the people she's allowed to interact with. After they've controlled her marriage, after they've controlled her finances, they control the people that she's allowed to have in her friendship group. And she writes to them 
And it's really emotive. And she talks about how she feels so, so betrayed by them um, because they had that level of control and they weren't allowed to face it. Um, so she, she doesn't die because of her belief, but she is, um, she is persecuted. Um, and another one would be um, René de Ferra, who's another member of the French nobility who marries into the Italian nobility. And when she becomes um, a reformer, when she, she takes communion in, in both ways, which marks her turn of faith, um, she's, she's locked away and has her children taken away from her and um, isn't allowed to see them unless she, unless she repents and converts back to um, Catholicism, which she ends up doing because she you know, wants to see her children. That's a reasonable thing. So they had all this pressure that was put on them because society enabled it to happen. And that's a form of persecution that we don't give enough credit to and that the reformers definitely didn't give enough credit to during the time. And I think it's important that we mark it. It's also interesting to me, it shows despite all of that persecution, women had a lot of agency. Um, I mean, they, they weren't, you know, they were able to be restricted in a million ways, but agency of mind to be like, I still think this and I still defy you. And they didn't just give in. And wow, those are really interesting stories. And I, I appreciate the way that the female experience of the persecution was very different than the persecution that men may, may have experienced. Thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. I feel like educators, um, need to know these nuances that you're talking about in order to better educate students on sort of the gendered impact of this time period. Yeah, if we if we compare them to the actions of the men in the Reformation um, without taking those kind of things into consideration, we are going to think that they they weren't as important and that um, they didn't do as much and that they, you know, could even just have been wives and mothers. Um, but when we think about the context and how the things they were up against varied differently, um, we're able to appreciate how incredible it is that they, they were able to do what they did do. Um, and all of a sudden, something as basic as writing a children's book um, becomes a huge act of defiance that we wouldn't have expected from a woman in that situation. Um, yeah, so it's important to have that in our minds when we read about these women. Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, The Other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.